Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. One of the first things that we need to ask ourselves is this. Are we willing to obey God at all costs? Because unless we're willing to make a life sacrifice for him, we have understood what he has done for us. God wants us to live not just an acceptable life, but biblically, the scripture says, one that is well-pleasing to him. And in order to be well-pleasing to the living God, the Savior, our Messiah, we need to be individuals that are committed to his will. In this conference, we have two primary purposes. The first is to learn a little bit about Hanukkah and why this day is indeed important to believers, followers of Messiah Yeshua. And then our second purpose, and they're related, is to study word by word, verse by verse, the two chapters of the prophecy of Haggai. And again, there is a relationship between these two things, the prophecy of Haggai and the festival of Hanukkah. Now, most of you who are watching, you are watching because you have already determined that Hanukkah is to some degree important to God. And probably the reason why you've come to that conclusion is because you've read the Gospel of John with understanding. You see, many people read that book without understanding. They come to that verse that's so relevant for us, John chapter 10 and verse 22, where it says, And Yeshua went up to Jerusalem. It was winter time, and he went up for the festival of Hanukkah. Now, if you're a good student of John's gospel, you will be reminded that he went up in John chapter 2 for Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. In John chapter 5, that same language, there's a festival, and he goes up to participate, to, to show us an example of what? A God-fearing man, a God-fearing woman, how they behave. So he goes up, presumably in John 5, for the Feast of Shavuot, Pentecost. That day that later on in a few years, the Holy Spirit would be poured out. And then again in John chapter 7, he goes up for the Feast of Tabernacles. So these three festivals, Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles. And then in John chapter 10, the same language is used, and this shows significance. Because many will say to you, well, I understand that the festivals that are in the Torah, that are found in the book of Leviticus, these are the appointed days. But from a New Testament perspective, from John's perspective, one that's inspired certainly by the Holy Spirit, that language, that same language, as it applies to not only Passover, Pentecost, and the Feast of Tabernacles, but also to the Feast of Dedication, which is what the word Hanukkah means, dedication. We see that Yeshua, he put these festivals on the same level. Now, many people want to attack Hanukkah. They'll say that, well, we don't know much about it. And from a biblical revelation, we don't, but we know something. We know that historically, in the time of Yeshua and before, this festival was an eight-day festival. Now, we have the tradition, whether it's factual or not, each person needs to determine in their own mind, but we have the account 
concerning Hanukkah being eight days. And eight is such an important number because eight relates to that which is new and, hear this carefully, that which is related to the kingdom of God. Now, when we speak of Hanukkah generally, what we can be assured of historically is that it speaks of a victory, a miraculous victory, one that, and hear this carefully, the purpose, the reason why initially just this one man and then his family and then other priests and then others throughout the nation, why they joined together to fight was for the right to worship God according to biblical truth, according to the laws, the commandments of God. So before we go any further in our study, we need to ask ourselves, are we willing to be committed, to be willing to risk our life in order to obey the instructions of God? My, my concern is that many people who say, they are Yeshua's disciples, that they believe in this one called Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth. Well, they like the fact that they'll go to heaven. They want him there to help him in difficult times. But are they really willing to lay down their life in order to obey the instructions of the word of God? That group initially, 2,200 years ago almost, they were willing to do so. And here's the miracle of Hanukkah, that God moved and he gave to those that were righteous, wanting to demonstrate the word of God. He gave victory to the righteous over the unrighteous, to those that were impure. He defeated for those who wanted to experience and express the purity of God. It was because of a desire to be obedient, to be like God, and to express his purposes that God moved. Now, here's something that you may not know. And one of the reasons why Hanukkah is related to light is not just that, that miracle, according to tradition, that happened with that oil. There's another reason. And that is because in that victory, God manifested himself. The tradition of the ancient sages is this. The reason why that miracle of the oil took place is not simply to make a miracle with oil, but to remind the people that it was through God's revelation, his presence, that that victory over the Greek empire came about. So it's victory over the enemies, those who stand in opposition to the truth of God. And when we look, and we'll see this in our study of Haggai this evening, we will see that the prophecy of Haggai has some hints, relationships to Hanukkah according to the date, and we'll see what that means in a second. But it shows that Hanukkah has implications, connections to the kingdom of God and ultimately the manifestation of God in his victory. Where? In the kingdom of God. You see, the menorah, that one that was in the tabernacle and then the temple, when it was lit, when the oil burned, one of the things that people should realize is that God, his presence is with the people. And that's why it was in Jerusalem, this place that was set apart, sanctified, named for the name of God, in order that we might approach him and worship him. So Hanukkah is inherently tied to those who want to worship God and express his righteousness, embrace his purity, so that his light, his glory, is manifested to others. This is why John included that fact that the Holy Spirit led him, commanded him to write down in John chapter 10, verse 22, that Yeshua went up to celebrate this festival of Hanukkah. Well, 
at the end of our second session tonight, as we come to a conclusion of the prophecy of Haggai, we are going to see a, a natural, one that the scripture bear witness to, a transition into the last days and the kingdom being manifested and what we should know about this transition into the kingdom times. But until then, let's begin our study of Haggai. Take out your Bible and look with me to Haggai in chapter 1. Now, the first thing that, that we need to realize is this. Not only are numbers important in the scripture, but also names. Names have meaning. And the name Haggai comes from the Hebrew word Chag, which is festival. And what we find here is if one wants to say my festival, he would say Chagi. But if we want to say my festivals, it would be Chagai. So here, that name speaks of festivals in the plural. God's festivals. What festivals are we talking about? Well, that's a question that you and I need to remember as we study this book. So let's begin. Haggai chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. In the second year. Now, the number 2 speaks about Two different perspectives. And we're going to see immediately in this first chapter that the people and God, they did not agree. They did not have the same perspective. And really, that's a question for us. We need to ask ourselves, do I have God's perspective? Do I see things from his vantage point? Am I looking at my life? the things around me, and seeing them how God sees them so that I can behave as God would behave, what he would call, command me to do. So we look here, and it's in the second year of an individual, Daryavesh. Now, we learn a lot about Daryavesh in the, the book of Daniel, that dynasty, but here what we find is that there's a problem because it says in the second year of Daryavesh, the king. And this man was not a king in Jerusalem. And this speaks about the fact that the people were in exile. And this is important because even though in the days of Haggai, they had come out of exile, even though this was the case, learn something that the exile had not ended in its fullness. Why? For the same reason today, that the exile has not ended. That Roman exile that took place nearly 2,000 years ago, that began in 70 AD. Why do I say that? Well, I'm speaking from Ashdod, Israel. But we are not that far, less than an hour, and we can be in Jerusalem. And if you go to Jerusalem today, there's something missing. There is no temple in Jerusalem. And the fact that there's no temple speaks loudly to us. That God, he is not ultimately pleased with us. That we are not in kingdom times. And therefore, there's a degree of still spiritual exile that we are experiencing. So the king is not a Jewish king. He is not based in Jerusalem. In the second year of Daryavesh, the king, in the sixth month. And that sixth month is a month that is given upside, set apart according to tradition, Jewish law. You know what's unique about Elul? That every day in that month, except for Shabbat, the shofar is sounded. In other words, that month is known as the month of tshuva, of repentance. And certainly we're going to see in a few moments, as we continue on in this text, that the people, 
the people in Jerusalem and Judah, those who had come out of exile, the Babylonian exile, they, they needed to repent. They did not have the purposes of God on their mind. So in the sixth month and on the first day of the month, and this is Rosh Chodesh. It is a day you read, for example, in the book of First and Second Samuel, and you are taught, as well as from the book of Leviticus, that the first day of the biblical month has significance. We, we set it aside. Now, it's not treated like a Shabbat. Nothing is forbidden, but oftentimes, historically, those who were most serious by, about God, they did not work. This was a day of celebration. It was a day to rejoice, and here's the key, to rejoice with the Lord. But here's the problem. The Lord was not invited. The Lord was not upon their minds. They were not living a repentant life. They were not interested truly in worshiping God, and we'll see why in a moment. So on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord was to, and notice this, it literally says, was in the hand of Haggai the prophet. Now, what's important is this. It says, in the hand. And that term speaks of, that expression, it's an idiom. It speaks about, it speaks about the authority of this prophet. Because the word of God came to him, he had divine authority. God gave this individual, this human being, this mere man, authority to speak and to bring about change. That's what the word of God does. It comes with authority to bring about change. And if you live in a home that the word of God is set aside, not taken seriously, you're going to have change, but it's not going to be a God-pleasing change. So the word was in the hand of Haggai the prophet, and it came to Zerubbabel, the son of Shaltiel, who was the governor of Judah, the leader, an important man, and also not just the, the authority from a governmental standpoint, but also to one called Yehoshua, the son of Yehoshadak, who was the high priest. And what was the word saying? Look at verse 2. Thus said the Lord of hosts, saying, this people. Now, he's talking to the leader of Judah, who was in Jerusalem, and with him, was the great high priest. And we see that the word came to speak about the people, their people, the ones that they were entrusted to lead, to have influence over. And they, as we're going to see, had to make a decision whether the word of God was going to change them, impact them, influence them or not. But it came concerning, notice what the scripture says, to this people because this people say middle of, of verse verse three it's verse two where it says thus says the lord of hosts this people what they are saying is this that the time has not come for the house of the lord to be built now where are they getting that is there another prophet in their midst that has given a proclamation from heaven that it is not the time for the house of the Lord to be built? There's no such prophet. There is no proclamation from heaven. This is what they want. They weren't so interested in worshiping God. They didn't see great relevance in, in worshiping God his presence with them. They didn't want the house of the Lord among them. They were doing just fine. And how do we know that they were doing well without God from a physical standpoint? 
Well, we keep reading. Look now to, to verse 3. And it came about, and here's the second time we see this. And it came about the word of the Lord in the hand of Haggai, the prophet, saying, Is it the time for you to dwell in your, and the word here is homes, but this would be paneled homes. Homes that, according to the, the best interpreters of Scripture, those who understand the language far better than I, they speak of this word as showing a degree of that which is luxurious, that which is expensive. It shows that this time, in one sense, the people, they were prosperous, that they could make for themselves very, very nice homes. It was time from their standpoint to live in nice homes themselves. But what about the house of God? Look again. The people were saying, it is the time, they felt God was asking them, is it the time for you to dwell in paneled homes, homes that have the finest attention, while the house, this house, meaning the temple, the word by it can refer to the temple. This house, and it uses the word charev, which means destroyed, charev, destroyed. And now, thus says the Lord of hosts, and he's going to say this frequently. He's going to use an expression. Now, probably in your Bible, it will say, pay attention. But it's literally the word which means, set your heart, fix your heart. And the word heart is related to a thought, a mindset. So what he's saying is, you need to make an adjustment. There needs to be a realigning of your thoughts. So he says, by doing so, this is how you have the right perspective. He says, look again at our text, middle of verse 5. Pay attention. Set your hearts upon your ways, how you're living. And he says, verse 6. You sow much, meaning you plant many seeds, but you bring in little. You eat, and there is no satisfaction. You drink, but there is no intoxication. You, you wear clothes, but, but there is not warmth to you. You earn wages, and the wages are put into a bundle with, with holes in them, one that is porous. So what is he saying here? Here's the important point. The people, they act, they do. They're not lazy. They're working. But here's the problem. They are not getting the results that they should. And what he's speaking about here is an experience that is frustrating. Now, I say that because this is what the Word of God reveals, but not too long ago, I was reading in a magazine, and this magazine came from a perspective of psychology, and they asked people, they took a survey, and they asked people, describe the most prevalent feeling that you have in your life. And you know what it was? Frustration. People were frustrated with their life. And what was interesting was this. That same degree of frustration, it was similar whether you were very wealthy or whether you were poor. In fact, some of the most frustrated people were the ones that had the greatest earthly resources, the greatest earthly prosperity. But make no mistake about it, they were frustrated. They were not achieving what they thought they should how they were investing, what they were doing, they were not getting the results that they expected. Verse 7. Thus said the Lord of hosts. And whenever he says this, it speaks about his power to carry things out. His ability to make what he says into a reality. Verse, verse 7. Thus said the Lord of hosts. Second time he says Set your hearts 
upon your ways. This is what he's telling them, commanding them. And this is for the purpose of ending their frustration. Here's the message. God does not want his covenant people to be frustrated. No, when we are in his will, when we are committed to his ways, when we are emphasizing biblical worship, worshiping him in spirit and in truth, we're not going to experience frustration. Now, we may have problems, but despite those problems, those hardships, those attacks of the enemies that that certainly will will be prevalent, despite all of this, you know what? God will give us that joy. We will have, and here's the key, we will have satisfaction. We will have an experience where we feel inwardly secure, at peace with with ourselves and our relationship with God because we see God working in our life and we are experiencing his presence, his comfort, and his provision in our life. When we are in his will, we will have his provision. So he says to the people in verse 8, he tells them what to do. Go up on the mountain and bring wood and build the house. Just that simple. He didn't say uh, if the, the permits can be obtained, if you have enough resources saved up. Didn't say any of that. He says, here's my revelation, now do it. It's not difficult. It's not hard to comprehend. But the question is, are we going to take simple truth and put it into action? When the body of believers have to struggle and debate about should we assemble and worship together because of a very, very questionable on how lethal it truly is, that coronavirus, when we are put into fear and a frenzy and we don't want to worship, we don't want to assemble, that says that we don't understand the simple commandments of God where he says for us to assemble together. We need that community, that fellowship, Now, we can do a lot via the lens and technology, but it's not the same thing. We need to get serious. We need to be people that that hear what God says and responds. What did he say nearly 2,500 years ago? He says, go up on the mountain and bring wood and build the house. Why? He says... And I will be delighted in it. Now, it's a word for want or desire. And God is saying basically is my desire will be met. That's what should interest us. First and foremost, what is the will of God? Are we fulfilling his will? So he says I will will be desirous in it and honored says the Lord. Verse 9. Now, because he knows that that people sometimes, we need to have a second measure of encouragement. We we are told what to do and we, we want to pray about it. We want to delay and stuff. So he tells us, look at this next verse. Verse 9. He says, you have turned too much, meaning You've expected much is the idiom, the implication of that. But behold, what is there? Little. You have brought home things, but why don't you have what you have worked for, what you have earned? He says, because I have blown it away. And why has he done that? On account of what? Says the Lord of hosts. Because my house, it is... Here it is, destroyed. And no one is concerned about, and here's the principle that he's giving. That temple in Jerusalem was a testimony. It was a house of testimony. 
How do we know this? Well, if you've been going through the book of Exodus with us, you'll know something. That the place where God dwelt, we have the expression, Shekhinat Hashem, the dwelling presence of God. The glorious dwelling presence of God. It was where his presence was on the kaport, that is that mercy seat, that lid for the ark of what? You may say the ark of the covenant, and you're right, but in the book of Exodus, we see more often than not it being called the ark of testimony. And the house of God laid in ruins it was destroyed people would walk by that all the time and no one no one no one had said let's build it let's restore it let's go back to a biblical expression of worshiping God based upon his instructions no one said that so we read why was God Not blessing the people because my house is destroyed. But you, you run every man to his own house. We have a home, but God did not. Verse 10. Therefore, what's God going to do? Well, he has worked among the people. He has blessed them over and over years and years. But none of them, here's the problem, none of them had shown sensitivity to the desire, the will of God. None had taken the word of God and what it says about worshiping him and said, we're not living a life that is truly pleasing to him based upon his instructions. So God says in this passage, You all run home to your house. Therefore, he says, unto you. And now it's a counting that's going to take place. The people are going to get an accounting from God of his perspective upon them. He says, unto you, the heavens will end from its due. The heavens won't provide due anymore. And the land will finish, it will end its produce. Now, we see something, and and don't miss this. This is something that not just the prophet Haggai, but, but I believe every prophet speaks about the significance of the land and how we can look at that land and understand the spiritual condition of the people and how God's going to respond what he's going to do, how he's going to act in this world. The land of Israel, it is a type of barometer that gives us a spiritual measurement of of the people of the world and what God is going to do in response. So he says, water is going to be stopped. Biblically, water is related to blessing and life. The land is not going to give its produce. Now look at verse 11. And I, God is speaking, I will call, and there's a play on words. Now the word charev has to do with destruction. He has used this word at least two times when he says, my house, my temple is destroyed. And now he's going to use that same word. It looks identical. Same letters, only the vowel pointings that men put in later on tells us that it's a word which means now a drought. Now, drought brings about destruction. It's a process, a slow process of of dying out. And that's what he says that's going to happen to the people. I will proclaim a drought upon the land upon the mountains, upon the grain, upon the new wine, upon the oil, and upon that which goes forth from the land, and concerning man and concerning beasts, 
and also concerning all the effort, the work, the labor of your hand. Now, years had gone by, and God allowed them to be prosperous. They built those beautiful hands, homes, but little by little, things are changing. Now, I want to pause for a moment to say, this is what's happening today. Little by little, maybe from our standpoint, things are changing rapidly from what they were. But it's been slowly. When we think about how corrupt the world is, what takes place in so many nations, and the world is silent, the powers that be ignore the plight of the suffering today in so many places. They, they do not get involved in order to stand for human rights. The dignity of, of women and children, the born and the unborn. And little by little, God has set quietly. But I believe that we can see change. Change is happening. God's displeasure is in the horizon. And things are going to be different and different quickly. The question is, are we going to be worshiping God in the midst of this? Demonstrating our testimony. Having God's perspective and God's work activity in our life. Verse 12. Now, verse 12 it is where it begins to be interesting. In the sense that we see an outcome. A result. We begin to see how God, His word, His prophetic truth, that there's going to be a response. Just stop for a moment and ask yourself Am I hearing from God? If you want to, you will. When I say you want to, it's real simple. God, whatever you tell me, whatever you put on my heart, whatever you reveal to me, I will do this, God will speak. God will lead. God will guide you. God will give you insight. But if you're not willing to obey, you probably are not going to hear his revelation. But when Haggai spoke, notice what we see. Now, up until this time, there's only been three men mentioned, Jewish men, not speaking about Daryavesh, but three Jewish men. Haggai the prophet, Yahushua the high priest, and Zerubbabel, the governor of Judah. And notice what it says. Look now to verse, verse 12. And Zerubbabel, the son of Shatiel, and Yahushua, the son of Yehoshadak, the high priest. And who else? Notice this. This is so significant. And I know it's significant because this phrase is going to repeat several times. And that's how we know what's important in the scripture. When we have the understanding of how to interpret the methodology to use in rendering the scripture and applying it to our life, it's not difficult. We can understand. Notice what he says. And all, all of who? All the remnant of the people. Why is that there? It's there because most people were unmoved by Haggai's prophecy. Most people, they saw the same things, they heard the same thing, but they did not care. They had a spirit of indifference. What about you? You know, the scripture says in the book of Revelation, God speaks and it's literally the Son of God, Messiah, our Savior, Yeshua. He says, I, I would that you were either hot or cold. But because you're lukewarm, that is, because you have that spirit of indifference, I will spit you, vomit you out of my mouth. And today when we look at many Believers, many congregations, many who claim to be disciples of Yeshua. The problem is, 
I see that spirit of indifference. One of the things that I pray frequently is that spirit of indifference would not come upon me. We need to have a spirit of zeal. We need to be excited. What does the scripture say? I quote this often in, in my teachings from the book of Luke chapter 21 and, and verse 28 when it says, and Messiah is speaking here about some difficult things that are going to happen in the last days. And he says, when you see these things, we're going to see difficult things. He's speaking to disciples. He says, when you see these things, lift up your head. That is an idiom. Be encouraged. Get ready. God's going to recognize you. How might he recognize you? By empowering you. By giving you that insight, that perspective that you need to be a godly witness in the midst of these changing times. So we look in verse, verse 11, verse 12, and it says, And Zerubbabel, the son of Shatiel, he heard, and Yehoshua, the son of Jehoshadak, the high priest, and all the remnant, not the majority, but this word means a small minority of the people. They heard the voice of the Lord, and here's what's important, the voice of the Lord, their God. You know what that speaks of? They had a covenantal relationship. And they were pursuing covenantal promises. This is what caused them, moved them, motivated them to be faithful, to hear and obey. They heard the voice of the Lord their God concerning the words of Haggai the prophet. Just as the Lord sent him, the Lord their God sent him. And what do we see? And the people, they feared from before the Lord. What does that mean? They gave God priority. Ask yourself something. Does your life manifest God's priorities? When you see how you handle your finances, how you manage your time, all the resources that you have, when God evaluates them, and he is always, always, when he evaluates that, does he see a person who is manifesting the priorities of God? Or are you pursuing your priorities and have been deceived by false teaching to believe that those, your priorities, are your God-given destiny, your, your dream that God has given to you? Let me tell you, more often than not, People do not get dreams from God that tells them what to do with their life. Can it happen? Yes, it can. Is it rare? Exceedingly, exceedingly, exceedingly rare. This is what the vast majority of people who are believers, how they are led by the Holy Spirit, how they discover God's plan for their life, their true destiny. And what is that? They read God's instruction his commandments, and they take those commandments and under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, they apply them to their life in order to obey, to walk with God. And it's in that midst of intimacy with God, God reveals to you his plans, his purposes for your life. That's the norm. It's not sitting in disobedience and hearing, ah, I get a dream from God, and that dream is exactly what I've wanted all my life. You know, I have found this. I have found that, that what I wanted all my life was not what God wants. That is why so frequently, I think all the time, don't you, that in order to take hold of God's purposes, it requires that the person, right, repents. Repent comes from the word for change, a change of course. It is a false teaching. It is heresy to teach and believe that I don't need to repent. I don't need to change. What was of interest to me all my life, that's exactly what God has for me. No, 
he does not. Now, this may not be popular, but nowhere in the word of God are we called to be popular. It's not there. We're called to be people who are obedient, and obedient usually is an outcome of humility. And humility is when you care about God, his perspective, and not the perspective of others. These men, Zerubbabel, Yahushua, and all the remnant of the people, they gave priority to God, verse 13. And Haggai said, and who's Haggai? Malach Hashem, the messenger of the Lord, in his message of the Lord to the people. Notice he was a messenger. God gave him a message and he gave it. He gave it to the people saying, I am with you, declares the Lord. What a wonderful message of encouragement. I mean, if God is with us, I'm going to misquote the verse, it doesn't matter who's against us, right? If God is with me, it doesn't matter who the opponent is. And what God is saying here, and notice something, what is he asking the people to do? Build the temple. Why? Worship. Why did the Maccabees, why did that, that small, that remnant of Jewish people nearly 2,200 years ago, why did they go to war against, against the mighty Greek empire? To worship God. And it's only when we put the worship of God above all things, then and only then, are we going to experience that anointing, that power, that we're going to be given that perspective, and that we're going to be like these individuals? Notice what it says. Because Haggai, this messenger of the Lord, in the message of the Lord for the people, he spoke, I am with you, and with you is an expression that relates to redemption. And redemption always always has a connection to worship. Verse 14. Now, it was because, and pay attention to what's happening. There is significance in the chronological order. It is because Haggai was faithful. He spoke that word. The people heard and they wanted to obey. They gave their lives. They made that change, giving heed to the priorities of God. God says, I am with you. God is going to move in their midst. And notice the last thing he did here. Look at verse 14. And the Lord, he stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shatiel, the governor of Judah. He stirred up this leader. And the spirit of Yahushua, the son of Yehoshadak. By the way, Yehoshadak, that name means God is righteous. The Lord is righteous. So he stirred up the spirit of these two men, the governor of Judah, and also, also the high priests. And we see that the spirit of also the remnant of the people, only those who heard and gave God priority. God stirred up their spirit of the remnant of the people. And they came, and this is what's important. They came and they did the work in the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. God, what did he do? It's so easy to see. God set them to work. He gave them. They didn't just stumble upon this. It came by prophetic revelation these people they had those wonderful homes and they were living in their minds just fine oh they were frustrated they didn't have that that peace that contentment but but they were doing okay and what happened only through prophetic revelation that caused them to change to turn to repent and only after that did the spirit of god begin to touch 
these individuals, not all the people, but just two men and the remnant. One high priest, one governor, and the remnant of the people. And God says, get to work. I believe, I, I know I'm not a prophet, but I'll say this. I can give you a prophetic truth right now. And that is God is telling his people, get to work. You say, how? Follow his priorities. And we're going to see that Hanukkah, this, this festival of dedication, this one that speaks about God's presence and his revelation, his illumination, that is light, all of that is so that we can get to work and do the things that are pleasing to him. One more verse. Look at verse 15. Now, this verse is short, but there is much information. Now, notice that this prophecy, it began on the first day of the sixth month. And we're going to see, as we read this last verse of this first session, 24 days have, have elapsed. And in actuality, if you count them, what you're going to find is this. You're going to find that that number 24 is of great significance. Don't take my word. We're going to see the number 24 being emphasized in Haggai chapter 2. And that has special significance for what we're studying, the theme, the primary objective of this conference. Look at verse 15. And on the 24th day of the sixth month, they're still in that month of tshuva, of repentance. 24 days, three and a half weeks have transpired. And something is about to happen. We'll see that in our second session. But on the 24th day of the sixth month, still in that same second year of Daryavish, the king, God's word, only 24 days. But what a change that is going to happen. Now, we've concluded chapter 1. We'll begin in a half an hour, chapter 2. But don't think that nothing happens in between. Because what has happened is this. The people have responded. They have gone to work. They've obeyed God. They went and got the wood. And they have built the temple of God. And it's only when we remember that and the second chapter will clearly confirm this. It is only when we understand in chapter 2 that temple, it's going to be there. God's presence is going to speak to the people. And we're going to see that because they've obeyed, because God's presence came, because his prophetic word continued, what's going to happen? God is going to give an earth-shaking revelation. This second chapter is full of some of the most significant, most relevant prophecy in all the Bible. And we're going to see that it's tied to the dedication of the temple. And we're going to see that dedication, Hanukkah, Habayit, that dedication of the temple has much to teach us about the last days and the establishment of the kingdom of God. So my question to you is this. Are these things of interest to you? Because if you're not zealous, if you're not passionate about kingdom and kingdom worship, when these changes and changes, they are coming. They are on the horizon. And let me just share with you something. If you believe that this coronavirus is, is a plague sent by God, no way, no way, no way. Why? If it was a plague sent by God, we wouldn't be debating it right now. 
See, what is so significant about the coronavirus is not the virus itself. You know what is? How the governments and how believers have responded to it. It has manifested a lot about the world. So it is not some pestilence that has a last day uh, message to it in the sense that it is one of the plagues in the book of Revelation. It's not. No, we're going to see plagues by God. And when those plagues happen, and we see that Messiah taught that in Matthew 24, Luke 21, Matthew 13, or Mark 13, that there is going to be wars, rumors of wars, earthquakes, pestilence, and that's in the plural, earthquakes, famines, all types of, of things that bring about great instability. Now, this may simply be just the, the first, first uh, evidence that change is coming. It is more related to the sinfulness of man and the changes that man wants to bring in this world than anything having to do with a true pestilence that's sent by God. What I'll say as we conclude this first session is that you better get ready because when God sends one of his pestilence to this world, you are going to be shocked about what the outcome. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel.